Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's free. Thank you know. If you want to give a donation? Say brochure. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Rata. I work for the City of St. Louis, the Community Development Administration. What? How are you feel? Your last name here? It's Bill. Here? It's not on there. No. Okay. Uh, I have cards over there though as well on the table. So. Okay. Uh, but it's spelled R A T A J. Okay, so um, the Healthy Home Repair Program is a program where we help with just about everything you need as far as home repair. All right, let me tell you what we don't do. We're not going to build a new garage. We're not going to put a room addition on. And we're not going to put a world floor or a jacuzzi. And I mention those things because especially the jacuzzi, we have people ask us a lot. So, um, we also don't do like remodeling. You know, we're not going to give you all new kitchen cabinets with granite countertops and things like that. If we did that, we'd spend $100,000 on a house. So we're not going to be a show you see on TV, right? Um, but what we do is we repair, like, we don't repair roofs, we replace roofs, okay? So if the roof is leaking on this side over here, and say we patched it, six months later, it's going to be leaking on the other side. So we're always going to replace the roof. Uh, we put in new windows, we put in new furnaces, doors, air conditioners, tuck pointing, um, we replace hot water heaters, we um, replace collapsed sewer laterals, new water lines, um, gutters. Gutters, yeah. If we do the roof, we're going to do the gutters and downspouts at the same time. Um, we'll do any kind of code violation. Um, you know, we just do about everything. Okay? Now, let me go over the requirements of the program. And uh, basically, um, ours are a little bit different. We are funded by the federal government through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Right. So they give the city what's called block grant monies every year. So we have to abide by the rules that they set for the program. The main rule is there are income guidelines. So it depends on your family size. So in the brochure, there's a chart and how many people living in your home and what the maximum income is. And that's the gross annual income. It's not, it's not net income. And um, the income guidelines have not come out yet for 2015. They were supposed to be out in February, but um, they haven't been released yet. These will probably get adjusted. Actually, the last two years they've gone down slightly um, instead of going up. But in any event, you have to meet those income guidelines. All right. Now, you also have to, of course, live in the city. The program's only live in the city. You have to have owned your house for at least two years. All right? I'm sure probably everybody in this room has been in their home for over two years. Okay? Um, you have to have clear title to your home, meaning you actually have to own your home. Uh, a lot of times we've run across situations where people think they own the house, and they don't. You know, grandma had owned the house before. She passed away some years ago. But there was never a will, there was ne never went through probate, and uh, you know, the descendants have been living there, and they think they own a home. They don't actually own a home. It's still mm -hmm. grandma's home. Um, you have to be current on your real estate taxes, okay? Uh, you can't be in the payment plan. You actually have to have them paid in full. And the reason for that is the, the city and the aldermen feel like if you're going to get tax dollars to fix up your house, you should pay what you owe as far as taxes. If you have a mortgage, you have to return on your mortgage. Uh, we don't want to put money into a program where, or into a house where, God forbid, there's a foreclosure and you lose the house. And let's say we put, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars worth of repairs. Now the house is sitting vacant. All right, and you got a lot of people that want help through the program, so we want to make sure you're current on your mortgage. You do have to have homeowners insurance. Um, that's for your protection, most importantly, but it's also for the protection of the contractors that are going to be at your house, the inspectors that are going to be at your house, you know, anybody connected with the program that's going to be at your house. Um, and of course, the income limits. Um, now, we actually have a waiting list for the program right now. Just, it's a program that's run citywide, so there are so many people that want help. Um, we're really working through that waiting list. Um, 
Probably if you sign up today, you might be on the waiting list for about two years. In all honesty. And it's just because we have so many people. We have over a thousand people on the waiting list. Now, um, as big a number as that is, in January of last year, we had about 2,800 people on the waiting list. So now we're down to about a thousand. So we're moving through pretty quickly. Uh, we might even get to you a little bit faster, but that is, you know, I just want to let you know what the time frame is. Now, if anybody has an emergency type of situation, there is a remedy for that where we could address that right away, and then we can get to whatever else you need when it's your turn on the waiting list, okay? Now, let me tell you what the emergencies are. So, HUD limited um, emergencies to about five or six different things. One is a leaking roof. All right, so, you know, and if you just got like a little spot up there or something like that, it's not really an emergency. But if you got a hole and you get water coming in regularly and stuff like that, that's going to be something that we're going to consider an emergency. Um, your sewer line collapse. You know, you got sewage backing up in your basement or whatever. Your water line broke. You got no water service coming in your house. Uh, furnace is inoperable. Doesn't work anymore. You know, you got to have heat, uh, so that's something we consider an emergency. Uh, you might have a hazardous electrical situation, maybe Amarin has maybe shut off your power or, you know, you turn something on and sparks come out of an outlet or something like that. You know, that's a dangerous situation. We don't want anybody's house to burn down. Uh, that a wheelchair ramp, if somebody needs a wheelchair ramp, uh, you know, to get in and out of the house, we'll consider that a priority as well. So if you have any of those things, you know, like I said, we can address that for right now, and then when you get to your turn the waiting list, we'll address everything else. Um, let me give you a general idea how the program works. So let's say, okay, so nobody has any emergencies, and we get to your name on the waiting list. You will actually get an application from our office at CDA. It'll be mailed to you. And we give you about three weeks to turn in the application. And the application itself is pretty straightforward. It's, you know, filling in the blanks, answering some questions, things like that. On the back of the application, there's a list of documents that you have to provide. And a lot of people will fill out the application and they'll send us the documents. Or they will fill out the application and they'll send us two of ten documents. So what that does is it just delays things. So we have to go back and forth saying, okay, we have your application, but you didn't send us these eight things. So we send them a letter, we tell them what the eight things are. We get a, uh, something back in the mail, there's only three of the eight things. So we send them, okay, we got those three, but we need these five. So it just delays things, it takes a lot longer. Um, most of the things that we ask for are what the federal government requires. So, you know, proof of your income, proof that you own the house, um, proof that you live in the house. So, you know, we're going to be asking for, you know, if anybody in the household works, the four most recent paycheck stubs, if somebody's on Social Security disability, the ward letter, pension letter, you know, things like that as far as income. Uh, we also ask for copies of utility bills and um, proof of your insurance, proof that you paid your taxes, you know, copy your, your deed to show that you actually are the owner of the house, things like that. So it's not... Anything you don't already have, um, you know, so it shouldn't be too difficult, but, you know, if, if you have difficulties, oh, you know, I lost a copy of my deed, I have to go down to City Hall and get it, can you give me a little bit more time to get my application? We're going to do that. We're not going to say, oh, you missed a deadline, too bad. You know, we'll work with you. We just ask that you communicate with us. So let's say you get the application in the mail. Um, we approve it. Then the next step is you'll get you'll have an inspection done. Now the um, inspections in the program are actually done by the city's building division, mm -hmm. and it's not the regular building inspectors that go through the neighborhood citing people for code violations. Okay, there are three uh, inspectors that only work in the Healthy Home Repair program. So when they come out to your house, they are going to look for code violations, but they are not going to write you up for them. They are not going to cite you for them, okay? I know people get a little nervous, oh my goodness, the building division is going to come to my house, and you know, what are they going to find? They'd find some stuff in my house, you know, if they came in today. Um, but um, 
they're not going to cite you. All right? But I, I mention that because a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, you know, that's kind of scary. Um, you know. So what they're going to do is they're going to identify any code issues, things that need to be addressed. And they will then produce a report that is going to go to Home Services. Home Services is a nonprofit who does our construction management. There's a little bit about them here on the, on the brochure. And they also do minor home repairs as well. Um, you know, and, and as Liz mentioned, Debbie couldn't be here. Uh, but they also do the construction management. So what they're going to do from that report that the building vision creates is they are going to um, produce a scope of work. Okay, so these are the things that need to get done. Now, they're going to include everything that the building inspector wrote up, all right? But they might, they might include some things that, what I would call are deferred maintenance. Um, a good example might be your hot water heater, okay? My hot water heater in my house is from 1987, all right? <laughs> I know I'm just biding time. I'm writing it out as long as I can. But at some point, that's going to need to be replaced, probably in the very near future. So they could say your hot water heater is 25 years old. Let's replace it while we're here. Your <coughs> furnace is 20 years old. Furnaces now are so much more efficient. Let's replace a furnace. It's going to save you, you know, some energy. It's going to save you a lot of on, on your utility bills. Or your roof. It's not leaking, but... You know, you look at a roof, and you can kind of tell when the shingles are getting old and stuff like that. You know, it's going to be a little bit of time before that needs to be replaced. So they'll add those things to the scope of work. When you, you said that you replace roofs, mm -hmm. my house has a tile roof. Okay. Uh, so uh, how do you guys approach that? Those are hard. Um, those like clay tiles? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, generally... Um, we can't we can't take the clay tiles off and you know just put shingles on. So you can't we can't generally mm -hmm. um, right. only because there is a federal regulation when you're using federal funds to fix up a house you have to do a uh, what's called a section 106 review. It's just the name of the act and the federal regulations. And if something's architecturally significant, you can't. Sometimes you can't replace it, period, but you, if you're going to do it, you have to replicate it exactly like it was. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, if we had to replace your roof, we had to put those clay tiles back on. Back on. Okay, yeah. but you take up everything. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it done in the neighborhood. So yeah. You take up that, put down all your wood and right. whatever, and, and place the tiles. Yeah, the exactly. Tiles. And okay. what happens is, you know, we require every contractor working on the job to get a building permit. So um, normally roofs don't require a permit unless you're replacing more than 15% of the sheathing. And the sheathing is like the wood, you know, that you attach your shingles and all the material to. So, um, but we require a permit nevertheless. Okay. So the roofer cannot start the work until the building inspector who did your initial inspection comes out. He sees what they did when they tore it off and he can see what the condition of that wood is, what the rafters are, things like that. And say, hey, you know, you're going to have to replace a couple rafters here. You're going to have to replace the sheeting over here, over here, over here, and over there, you know, besides what you were intending to do initially. So it's, it's a good system we have because, you know, the last thing you want is we put a new roof on and it's leaky. Right. Okay. You know, um, so when they do the scope of work, um, what they do is then they have a bid walkthrough. So, all right, they got all the items on the scope. They'll have a series of contractors come out to your house, and they usually do them on Fridays, um, where you might have you might have electricians, you might have plumbers, you might have guys that do the furnace, you have the HVAC guys, you might have a roofer, you might have a general contractor, you might have a whole host of contractors come out to your house, and they will provide bids. <coughs> So when the um, bids are received and you know what the cost is going to be, you'll get a letter that says, please come into the offices. You can kind of, uh, you can schedule your appointment, you can sign the paperwork, and the work can then begin. 
Now, the way the program is set up is there, there's two components. There's a forgivable loan and there's a deferred payment loan. Okay? The forgivable loan is a five-year forgivable loan. So if you live in the house for five years, you don't move out, you don't transfer the title, you don't sell it, at the end of five years, that loan is forgiven. It's also forgiven at the rate of 20% on each annual anniversary date. So, um, you know, let's say you said, you know, year three, I've had enough of these St. Louis winters, I'm going to move down to Florida. So we would forgive 60% or $6,000 of that $10,000. And then when you sold the house, the $4,000 that's still on the books would get repaid through the proceeds of the sale. So you don't have to come up with it out of your pocket, okay? Um, anything over 10000 so let's just say your, your project costs 17000 All right, so the, the 10000 is going to be the five-year forgivable loan. The 7000 is a deferred payment loan, which is essentially a due-on-sale loan. So the way that works is, you know, there, there's first of all, there's no interest that accrues on the loan. There's no monthly payments on those loans. So let's say... 20 years from now, the house gets sold. Um, that loan is still going to be the $7,000. It's not going to change, all right? And uh, <coughs> most folks, um, you know, probably all of you just about are planning on going to stay in the house the rest of your life, I would imagine. And then, you know, when you pass away, hopefully many, many years from now, you're going to leave the house to your children, I would think. And in most cases, your children are probably going to sell the house. So again, whatever that deferred amount is, that comes out of the proceeds of the sale. So your heirs don't have to come up with, out of their own pocket. Okay? Yes, what, what if the child already is living in the house and wants to stay there? If they're living in the house and they want to stay there, um, are, they part, are they an owner of the house? No. Okay. Well, um, unless they go to refinance the house or sell it, we're not going to know. You know what I mean? So... Got you. That answers my yeah. question. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, but, you know, most times they're sold, you know, and then when we get that money back, it goes back in the program to help Yeah, more I just wonder, because my niece would come and stay, live in my house, you know, if I need help, she would come. Sure. Sure. That brings up another question. Mm -hmm. when alone is when, when the 50 or whatever is up, mm -hmm. does somebody have to sign off? I mean, like, if you're the person that acquired the loan, mm -hmm. and uh, it's in your name, mm -hmm. and you then pass it on to someone else because you passed on, or however, mm -hmm. does somebody have to come and sign off? They don't sign off and say, but if there is a transfer of the title, mm -hmm. then technically our loan becomes due and payable mm -hmm. at that point. So I only have a transfer of title. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if if you are going to re, the only other time we'll ask for that back is let's say you're going to refinance and you're going to get a home equity loan for, say, $50,000 and you're going to pull a bunch of cash out. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're going to build an addition or a new garage or are you going to pay off a bunch of bills or take a vacation or something like that? You know, we're going to ask for our money back at that point because you're pulling all the equity out of the house. We'd like our mm -hmm. money back at that point. So, um, but other than that, I mean, if you're going to refinance, you know, let's say you have a mortgage at six percent now and you can refinance and get four and a half, you know, we're not going to ask for our money back then because you're actually, um, you know, pulling any cash out. You're just, you know improving your financial situation by getting a much lower mortgage payment. Question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this 7000 that you said is deferred, mm -hmm. eventually the only way you can get it is that you decide to sell the house and you want your money back. Is that the only way? The only way we get it back? Uh-huh. That basically <coughs> you decided to sell the house with the 7000 Or if you, yeah, or if... Um, What's the other way? If you moved out. Moved out. Or if you refinance and you're pulling some What cash. if, uh, and this is not me, what if somebody's already taken the second e equity out? You know, they've already did something called that senior whatever. A reverse mortgage? Yeah, that reverse mortgage. How would you know that they've already done it? 
Well, reverse mortgages are, are a little bit uh, tricky. Mm -hmm. It depends on the reverse mortgage company. <coughs> in theory, a house is supposed to be up to code in order to get the reverse mortgage in the first place, right? Um, the other problem is I know there are some mortgage, reverse mortgage lenders that do not want any other liens on the property. They only want theirs. Now, if we came in after them, our loan is going to be subordinate to theirs. They're going to still have first position on the title, you know. We would be second, and maybe third, but um, yeah, it depends on the, the lender. Yeah, no, and it comes up quite often, so it's a good question. Okay, any other questions? All right, um, there is, you know, if you're interested in the program, there's a um, hotline phone number. And the, uh, I'm right underneath the chart with the income guidelines. So you would want to uh, <coughs> call that number. Um, it's actually a recording, and we just ask that you leave your name and your address mm -hmm. and your phone number. We'll call you back. Um, it's not, it doesn't ring live because um, no one answers it when it rings because people, you know, the person that's charged with doing that will do nothing other than answer the phone all day. Uh, but we do call you back within 24 hours. And we'll ask you some questions on the phone. We'll do an intake uh, over the, you know, some information in the computer, things like that. So there's no way to come down there and pick up an application? No, just because of the waiting list. Right. Yes, sir. Is it fine for us to refer clients to you all? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, just give them that hotline number. Okay. What can I have a Sure. Anyone else? Thank you. That's all. Hi, Bill. How are you? Good. How are you? You may have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Can what is the waiting list? How long is in terms of time? Is I did talk about the waiting list. Um, at the start of 2014, it was close to 2,800. We were down to a little over 1,000. So and how many do you normally process in a year? Last year, we reduced the waiting list by 55%. So we're actually, I told the folks in here in this room that they didn't have an emergency. Um, that Probably the worst case we're looking at is about two years on the witness. So we really cut it down. Yeah. Thank you. Are the uh, contractors uh, cert, uh, certified? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. Do you, do you, I know about a set that's at the water company that they have a list of plumbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you use those or do you just have your own group? We have our own. Let me tell you how that works. That's a good question. I should have talked about the contractors. So um, the contractors are vetted in the program, right? So they have to um, have a business license, pay their city taxes. They have to be able to um, be bonded. Sometimes they have to have other licenses like uh, they're do anything that disturbs paint, they have to have lead-based paint certifications, things like that. Um, in some cases, they have to put up a payment and performance bond for the job. So if, um, you know, what that means is, let's say they start to work and something goes bad and they walk off the job. By us having a bond on the job, we can call the bond company and say, hey, this guy walked off the job, he's <coughs> or whatever. They're gonna pay to finish the job and fix any damages that resulted, all right? Um, but we, you know, we choose the contractors because they have to meet a bunch of other requirements as well. I understand that you choose them, but do we also pick off the list, the ones that you choose? No. Oh, you choose No, but now if you have somebody that you would like, and if they meet the qualifications, no, no, you know, no, we, no, could, no, we could... I'm just asking. I'm yeah. Just Once yeah. they're on your list, those are the ones that will be used in the house? Right. Okay. Right. Those will be the ones that we ask to come out and do the bidding. Um, let me just tell you, there's some, there's some checks and balances, too. We kind of talked about the roofs, how the inspector's there when they tear off the roof, and you can see the condition of the, all the wood and all that. Um, but, you know, you're going to have a series of inspections. Um, you're going to have inspections during the job, you know, before the job, during the job, and after the job is completed. But the building division, you know, they're going to inspect all the work to see if it meets the code, all right? Uh, but then home services does what I call like a quality assurance inspection as well. An example I like to use is tuck point. So the building inspector says, okay, on an initial scope, I wrote that they're supposed to tuck point, you know, seven feet from the parapet wall on the east side on the whole side of the house. 
So he's going to look at the work and say, okay, yeah, he filled in all those joints and he did exactly where I said to do it. He might sign off on it. But then Home Services comes out there and says, you know what? He did do that, but the guy was a little sloppy. He's got mortar in the bricks. There's mm -hmm. mortar on the ground. He's got to clean all that stuff up first before we'll sign off on it. And then the guy can get paid. So, um, and of course, we want you to be happy with it. We want you to sign off that you've accepted the work and paid the work too. So, you know, it's not going to be a situation where um, you're going to, you know, approve payment to a contract for work that wasn't up to your standards. Uh, so we had those checks and balances in place to, to help with that. Okay, any other questions? I live in a condominium. Mm -hmm. So I, the out, exterior of the building, wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't qualify for that. But the inter, internal things that I require, that I am responsible for in my unit, mm -hmm. I can apply for. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we do interior and exterior um, yeah. repairs. Condominiums sometimes are a little, yeah, you know, like if you, if you share a roof with your neighbor and your roof is leaking, like we, you know, ideally like to replace the whole roof. You know, again, you know, fix it on this side, it starts leaking over here, and vice versa. Yeah, but we have worked in condos in the past. Okay. And uh, one question. When they bring the supplies in, do they bring the supplies to your home, mm -hmm. where do they secure it? Do they did they just lay it out in the open, or should they be put it in the basement someplace so they can bring it out? Because you know people may come into your yard and take them. Take it, out. Yeah, no. Usually, um, they're gonna bring what they need just for the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes they might store it in the basement, but most of the time, if they don't use it, they're gonna take it back with them. So it's not just sitting in the yard. I have, a, I have a, some business cards over there, too, if you have any other questions you'd like to ask me. Um, you can give me a call on Monday. Okay.